So in our last uh, lesson, we uh, focused in on the beginnings of the two great cultures uh, that uh, uh, the Jewish culture and the um, uh, Arabian uh, cultures from which uh, the Muslim religion uh, has come and how their beginnings provided you know, a key to future generations. So there was, um, you know, I'll give you these little genealogies here. On the side of Hagar, right, who was Sarah's maid. Hagar, who was Sarah's slave or maid, had a child first with Abraham in order to try to fulfill God's promise through natural means, if we remember correctly. Sarah's getting older, she figures we're supposed to have a son, maybe, maybe God wants us to do it the way that our, our society seems to do this, you know, by if the, if, the, if the wife cannot have a, a, a child and the concubine has a child, you know, instead of the wife, still belongs to that family. So they, they go ahead and do that. Her son is Ishmael and from him came the 12 tribes that eventually formed the Arab nations. And from this nation also came the Muslim religion, as I mentioned before, which is widespread today and continues to honor Hagar and continues to honor Ishmael in their pilgrimages and in their rituals. So they, you know, they go back to her and they acknowledge that. Ishmael, however, was not God's choice for the promised seed and was not used to fulfill God's promise uh, to bring a savior into the world. Much as uh, Muslims uh, like to say that uh, the line goes through Ishmael and eventually to Muhammad, you know, and so on and so forth. Uh, this is how they trace uh, their history. But the, the problem there is that there is no fulfilled promise, no fulfilled prophecy in their writings and in their histories. There's no miracle, there are no miracles. There are fables, you know, uh, uh, someone going to heaven on the winged horse and so on and so forth, those type of things, you know what I'm saying? But there's no written prophecy from one you know, century that looks forward to two or three or seven centuries later and makes a prediction and then seven centuries later that prediction comes true. Uh, the Bible, the Old Testament part of it, has hundreds of those things. And within the context of Judaism and then later on, of course, within the context of Christianity. You know, if someone says to you, well, how can you decide which one is more, you know, more true? You know, don't they have a billion followers? It makes no difference. You, know, you, don't, you don't base truth on the number of followers. I've said that before. If that was the, if that was the case, then the communist Chinese have the truth because they have the most followers. So you know, we, don't go, we don't go by numbers. And then of course there's Sarah. Sarah was Abraham's wife uh, and when she was 90 years old through God's grace she gave birth to Isaac. And Isaac and his descendants formed the 12 tribes from which the Jewish nation was formed. And it was through this people that the Lord promised that the Messiah would come. So Ishmael and Isaac were in conflict together because of this from the very beginning. They, they, they strived with each other from the very beginning. And their descendants in the Middle East continue to be divided until this day. There's just no end to the strife that goes on. I heard somebody on the radio was talking about it, you know, American intervention, and the, and I, and the president uh, said that uh, uh, he, he wanted to manage, he wanted to manage and organize the Middle East. And that was, you know, you know, he, he may want to do that, but we know that that's not going to happen. You know, they, uh, so, someone else, a commentator says, that what, what the West doesn't seem to grasp is that this is not a war about politics. This is a war about religion. It's about religion and it's about who is uh, the correct leader you know, of which sect between the Shia and between the Sunni and the others. This, this war, this fight has been going on uh, for centuries and has only been kind of clamped down because many of these countries were ruled by you know, dictators and very strong people who could keep, keep the, the people apart. But the moment we had a quote general election and we, uh, we introduced quote democracy, you know, 
uh, we see the result of that. They go back to the war that they've been fighting for centuries. Not a, I'm not making a political statement here, I'm just saying we see from the Bible from the very beginning that they have been at war with each other and continue to do so uh, even to this day. Um, we also see how Hagar and Sarah were types. You know what I'm talking about when I say a type, right? Remember that? A preview, if you wish, of something that's going to happen in the, in, in, the, in, in the future. So we see how Hagar and Sarah are types that represented the relationship between those who seek to justify themselves by the law and those who seek to justify themselves by faith. So as Hagar was a slave, she wasn't chosen to be the one to carry the promise. Those who try to justify themselves by the law, they remain slaves. They do not profit from the promise and can only call this earthly city of Jerusalem home. So all this fighting about Jerusalem, you know, the Palestinians and the Jews, you know, they're fighting over who controls Jerusalem. It don't matter. It doesn't matter who controls the city of Jerusalem. Mean, it matters to them, but in the long run, it doesn't matter who controls that city. Because as Sarah was free, and she was the one who was promised the blessing, not Hagar, those who are justified by faith in Jesus are free from sin. They're free, they're not slaves. And they receive the blessings of the promise and they can aspire to be not in the old Jerusalem, but in the new Jerusalem. And the new Jerusalem isn't here on this earth. The new Jerusalem is in heaven, the new heaven, the new earth. That's, that's the new, that's the new uh, Jerusalem. Okay? And if you study Islam, you'll find that it is a religion of law. Absolutely. I mean, the word means surrender. So you surrender your will to Allah and you do the things that you must do. You must fast, you must give alms, you must the pilgrimage, you must pray five times a day, you must, you must, you must. Women must cover themselves, you must. And so the goal is to impose this law, this Sharia law, which is, comes out of their teachings, where people must do what they do in order to have a hope of going uh, to uh, heaven, to be in paradise. And in their religion, whether you go or not, doesn't matter. Allah is great. You do all the things you do and you still don't go, oh well, don't ask any questions. I mean, who would want a religion like that? You know, the religion we have, God makes a promise and His promise is based on His word and when you go through the word you find out that whatever God promises He delivers no matter what. There's no, He's not fickle like that. And our religion is a religion based on faith. We trust that God will give us what He's promised us despite our weaknesses, despite our failings. Okay, which religion do you want here? The must religion or the religion, of, the religion of faith? And so Hagar and Sarah are types that reflect the kind of religions that would ultimately come into the world. I've said this before, every other religion other than Christianity is a religion based on the principle of law. You must do things, whatever they are in order to. The only sure thing in Islam is if you die, you know, if you die in jihad, if you die in protecting, if you die in you know, the, the military or the violent protection or uh, dissemination of your faith, the promise is that you will go to paradise. The only, it's the only sure way to be in paradise. Every other way is, let's hope so. So that's very attractive in countries where the poverty level is very high, the education level is very low, the unemployment among young men is 40 to 50 percent, they have no hope to marry, because in their society they have to, you know, you can't just pick the girl and love will see us through, da, da, da. it's not the way it works in that society. So think now, you're a 20 year old guy, no hope to marry, 
no access, no comfort, no job, no future. Somebody comes along and says, you know, if you blow yourself up, not only will your family be honored in our society, not only will your family receive $2,000, but you, my friend, will be with the virgins in heaven. Well, he hasn't got a, he hasn't got a, he hasn't got a hope to get a virgin here on earth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? There's no hope for him to have marriage. I mean, I feel sorry for that young man. No hope. His only hope is violence. It's terrible. Anyways, we're far afield here, but the roots and the seeds of all of this thinking begin here. Okay? So the next chapters in Genesis will bring us to the climax of Abraham's life and recount the death of Sarah, the final days of Abraham's amazing journey of faith. So let's go to chapter 22, let's read verses one and two. It says, now it came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So in the scheme of things, there's a long period of silence between chapter 21 and chapter 22. There may be up to 20 years there of silence between one chapter and the other. As we see Isaac grow into young manhood, in chapter 21 he's just a, he's a kid, you know. in chapter 22 he's a young man. The silence is broken, however, with a chilling request that Abraham take his son and offer him as a sacrifice to God. Now there's some interesting words here that we want to look at. The word tempted is used. The idea of tempted can mean different things depending on the context. For example, tempted could mean to seduce someone or to draw someone into evil. It's what Satan does to draw us into sin and consequently cause our death. And so temptation can be an allurement to something that's weak an allurement that, that's weak within us, an allurement to do something that's wrong but that will give us great pleasure, so on and so forth. And then there's another meaning to the word and that is to test, not to seduce, but to test or to try in order to determine the worth of something. It's what engineers do to demonstrate the efficiency or the quality of a product or construction. You know? Quality control, I mean, you know, anybody who's worked in a factory uh, for a big company, quality control. You know, if you manufacture a product, it eventually goes through quality control because whatever it is, it has standards and the people in quality control test it to make sure that it adheres to the standards of the company or the government and so on and so forth. So uh, uh, to test from a God, from godly perspective is what God does to demonstrate to us or to the world that the quality or the strength of our faith and the quality and the strength of our character is acceptable. Okay? So one idea of tempted is to seduce someone. Another idea of tested or tempted is to try or to test or to evaluate the value. Okay? So Jesus, for example, was tested by God. His faith was examined through trials and through sufferings to demonstrate to others the quality of his character and the quality of his faith. So when it says he was brought out to the desert to be tested, it doesn't mean he was brought out there to be seduced. Okay? There was no sin in him, there's nothing in him that Satan could you know, appeal to for seduction purposes. But he was tested, he was examined to see you know, how his faith was. And so now Abraham is now being tested in the same way, not seduced, tested, examined. Well, you take a diamond, you hold it up to the light, you examine it for color and clarity and so on and so forth. So Abraham is now being tested in order to show the quality of his faith developed through a lifelong relationship with God. And so God wants to test, wants to show the quality of his faith to himself, to Abraham, to confirm to himself that he is a man of faith, to show the quality of his faith to the nations around him as a witness, 
and also to show the quality of his faith to future generations. Us, for example, he's a type. He is a type for a man with faith. He is a type that projects to us even today. Another word used is love. The first time that this word is used in the Bible is here. Now, it's significant that the first time the word love is used, it refers not to man-woman type love or to friendship type love, God-man love, not that type of love, but the love that a father has for his son. You know, take your son, the son that you love. First time the word love is mentioned. And any man that has a son, nothing to say against daughters, I've got daughters too, but any man who has a son knows that there's something about that. Okay. Interesting to note that the first time the word love is mentioned in the New Testament, it is mentioned in regard to the love that God has for His Son. Matthew 3.17, Mark 1.11, Luke 3.22. So in the Old Testament, love, first time it's mentioned, the love that Abraham has for his son. First time love is mentioned in the New Testament, the love that God has for his son. Kind of interesting parallel there. And so the first time it's mentioned in the fourth gospel of John, for example, it refers to the love that God has for us as our father and we as his children. So this primary mention and teaching on love in the Bible demonstrates the essence of that love, God's love that exists in the Godhead, God's love extended to man. Now man's love for God and for man comes only after this. In other words, before a man loves God, God has loved man. That's the point I'm trying to make here. All right, so let's take a look at verse three. It says, so Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, and, uh, and Isaac his son. And he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Abraham said to his young man, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there and we will worship and return to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son, and he took in his hand the fire and the knife, so the two of them walked on together. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. So we see Abraham, Isaac, two <coughs> servants, leave to go to Mount Moriah. Again, a passage that contains a wealth of type imagery of Jesus and His sacrifice. So Abraham is promised that through his seed, the Savior will come. And in this scene, God makes him act out, as it were, the very thing that the promise offered, salvation through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, Abraham didn't know this. We only see this through hindsight as we look at this particular scene. I want you to note that Abraham is willing to obey God's will and does not hesitate even leaving early the next day. Imagine if somebody asked you to go out and you know, sacrifice your son, you know, would you set the alarm for real early? You know, I might dawdle over coffee, you know what I'm saying? <coughs> Isaac and two slaves go along. They arrive at the place on the third day. Think now, on the third day. So this represents the three days that Jesus spent in the tomb. And somebody will say, well, what do you mean? I mean Isaac wasn't dead, but he was as good as dead. Because the minute Abraham said, let's go to the mountain, you know he's going to do it. So Isaac is as good as dead the moment they leave on the way to the mountain. Isaac already dead the moment that God asks Abraham to sacrifice and Abraham agrees, good is done. So he was as good as dead for three days before they arrived at the place of sacrifice. The servants are left behind and Isaac willingly goes with his father. There's no hesitation here as well. He is a willing sacrifice. I want you to note also that Abraham says to the servants that they both will return. He doesn't say, I'll be back. He said, we'll be back. Now he's intending to kill him. But he says to the servants, we'll both be back. And it's here that we see the great faith of Abraham. 
He is fully intending to sacrifice His Son. He is fully intending to return with Him alive. How do we answer that? Well, we go to Hebrews 11, verse 17 to 19. It says, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, notice the word tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son, his only son. All the promises circled around him. In other words, remember now, Abraham at the point that he was at, culturally, socially, theologically, he didn't understand about eternal life, you know, I come back as myself and I'll be myself in heaven. He didn't understand that. He understood that he would come back like he would live on through his son. And the promise that he would have, you know, you know, his, his descendants would be like the stars. For him, wow, I, I will not only live through my son, but I mean there's going to be countless generations that come after me. For him, that's, that's about the maximum of eternal life that he could think of. Okay? He, 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 didn't, he didn't have the revelation we have today of what eternal life is going to be like. So by sacrificing his son, okay, he's also sacrificing his own hope, if you wish, to live on. Okay? And so um, when he says they both will return, that's, that's unusual. So it says here, as I read, by faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. Come on. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. So there's the promise, right? And for, for Abraham that was like eternal life. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead from which He also received Him back as a type. And so Hebrews describes Abraham's faith as reaching the point where his only conclusion was that God could and would resurrect His Son from the dead if necessary to fulfill His promise. That's, that's how far his faith was getting stretched. His faith was getting stretched to a point beyond what he could imagine by himself or hope for himself. It was like God said that you know, I would have a son, there'd be def so God cannot lie, I totally believe it, and if God wants me to offer my son, then he must, he must be planning on bringing him back to life. It's the, only, it's the only answer, the only conclusion he could come to. He believed that through Isaac many generations would come. He was prepared to offer him a sacrifice, so his only conclusion was that somehow, he didn't understand how, somehow God would give him back his son from death. He didn't know how. He didn't know how. But he believed that God would. And so Abraham crossed an important frontier of faith and that was to understand that God gave life not just through His descendants, but could literally raise a person back from the dead. Abraham's eureka moment. Oh, wow, whoa, I just had a thought that I've never had before, you know what I'm saying? Note also that Isaac carries the wood for sacrifice on his back just like Jesus carried his own cross on his back, and that Abraham carries the knife, which is the symbol of life and death, just like the Father in heaven had power of life and death over Jesus. Jesus could not have died without God's permission. And also Isaac questions Abraham about the nature of the sacrifice, and Abraham assures him that God will provide, which is what will ultimately what they'll ultimately name the place where, um, where uh, this will take place. Mount Moriah means God will provide. God will provide. This place there with Abraham, this place will ultimately become the place where the temple will be built. <clears throat> and the sacrifices will be offered by the priests. A foreshadowing, okay, not only of the sacrificial system of the Jews, but also a further foreshadowing of the sacrifice that Jesus would ultimately make. Today, on that spot, 
this building there, the Dome of the Rock, the gold dome, the gold for the dome was donated to you know, the Palestinians uh, by uh, the King of Jordan. His, not the, the one that's there now, but his father donated the gold for the, for the, for the dome. This is what stands. I've been inside this building when I was in Jerusalem. It stands exactly where the temple stood, exactly where the Holy of Holies stood. This now stands there. And if you go inside, you have to take off your shoes and that. Nowadays, foreigners can't go inside. They're too sensitive. But when I went, you know, there wasn't as much trouble. <clears throat> Took off my shoes, went inside. And inside, it's just that building you know, with carpets, people sitting around. There's a railing, there's a big railing. And in the middle, there's this huge rock. I don't mean a boulder, but I mean an, outgro an outgrowth of rock. And they believe that Muhammad went to heaven on the, on the back of a winged horse from this spot. Nobody saw it. We're just talking. This is, this is what they believe. But this is a very uh, holy site. But the connection with the Bible is this is Abraham. This is where Abraham was. All right, let's keep going. So in verse 9, it says, Then they came to the place of which God had told him, and Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here I am. He said, Do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. Abraham called the name of that place, the Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it will be provided. So in this passage, we have several, again, types that project ahead a couple of important ideas. The first type is the sacrifice of Christ. The willingness of both the Father and the Son to do the will of God foreshadows the willingness of the heavenly Father and Son to offer the sacrifice of Christ. It's the mirror image of what took place in the New Testament. Secondly, it also is a type for vicarious atonement. At the last moment, a ram is substituted for Isaac. Okay. He was as good as dead, but God put a ram in his place. Something had to die because God had commanded it, so the ram takes his place. The idea of substitution, one dying for another, this is introduced here. Someone says, where do we get the idea that you know, this, this business of vicarious atonement, Jesus dying for us, you know, who, who thought that up? Well, God thought that up. But where do we see it in the Bible? We, we, well, we see it from the very beginning in Genesis where God slays an animal to provide animal skins to cover Adam and Eve. There's the first type right there. Something dies to provide for the shame of man. And here's the... Here that type is not only repeated, but it's like clarified, okay? much more clear. All right? uh, of course, in reality, a ram and not a lamb is offered because the lamb of God has yet to make an appearance. And then another type, the relationship between faith and works. If a person is considered right with God because he believes and trusts in God, what place does works have in the equation? Someone says that, you, know, you keep saying we're saved by faith. Why am I bothering making an effort to being a good person? Well, the answer is in James. James says, you believe that God is one, there's your faith, and you do well. The demons also believe and they shudder. So what's the difference? They also believe. It says, but are you willing to recognize, you foolish fellow, that faith without works is useless? Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar? So a person doesn't produce saving faith through works. A person's faith naturally produces works that demonstrate or justify his faith. It goes the other way around. I don't work to be saved. I believe to be saved. 
And this faith in me produces all kinds of good works. I am motivated to do what is right because I believe. I don't do what is right in order to save myself. I'm already saved. I do what is right or I make an attempt at it anyways, okay, because I love the Lord. I am so grateful for what He's done for me. Okay? Abraham's offering of Isaac is a type to demonstrate, and this, you know, my whole lesson comes to this statement here, so if, you, if you've drifted, come back to me please. Okay? Abraham's offering of Isaac is a type to demonstrate the degree of work a person could actually do if they believed to the degree that Abraham believed. So I ask you, which is harder to do? Tell a mountain to move or to offer up your only beloved son? To me, I mean, one thing be hard, as hard as the other. With faith, a person could do either one. That's the point that, that, that James is making here. He says, you see that faith was working with his works and as a result of the works, faith was perfected. And the scripture was fulfilled which says, and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. You see that a man is justified by works, not by faith alone. And so with faith, a person could do either and Abraham is a type to show what faith can do, not what faith must do. People read this and they say, man, do I, in order to have faith, do I, do I have to give up my son or do I have to give up something you know, so... No, the point here is not, this isn't an example of what you must do, it's an example of what you could actually do if you had Abraham's faith. It doesn't say you've got to have Abraham's faith to be saved, it just tells you the amount of things that you could do if you had Abraham's faith. You could even go to that level if you wanted. You could offer your own child and have confidence that God would take care of it. That's, that's, that's the point. Okay? So we don't have to do what Abraham did to be saved, but if our faith grows to be as great as his, we could do it if God asked us. And for some, God does ask, right? There's some of these people over in the Middle East who are Christians, uh, you know, maybe not Restoration Era Christians, but the, you know, believers in Jesus, you know, and they have to make a choice. You either confess Allah or you're a dead person. Sorry, won't confess Allah. Okay, bang, boom. Next, 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 you know, no big show. Making a big show about cutting off the head of the journalist. Well, that's because, I mean, that's a tragic thing for that man, you know, was he, you know ruthlessness. The point is that's for show. That's for show, because he's a journalist and because everybody's going to get up in arms about it. They haven't reported about the 102, 3, 4,000 Christians that they've just murdered one after another simply because they refuse to, to convert to Islam or to confess that Muhammad is Allah's prophet. That, that, that doesn't make the news, but it gets God's attention. And so their faith got their faith you know what I'm saying? Got them to the point where they could actually give up their lives for their faith. They had that kind of faith. I know one thing, God doesn't ask us what our faith won't permit us to do. He won't ask. Don't ever be afraid of that. So after this experience, God once again, I'm not going to read the next passages here, <clears throat> God once again confirms His promise to bless Abraham with descendants to a great number, He'd been prepared to offer his only son, and in return, God swears that his descendants will be like the stars, the sand on the seashore. The end has the same family history of Abraham's family back in the land of Ur. And then in chapter 23, I'm not going to read that, uh, chapter 23 describes the death of Sarah at the age of 127, which means that Isaac was 37 when she died, Abraham 137. Then there's a description also of Abraham buying the land where she would be buried. Remember, God promised him all the land, but he didn't own any of it, so he had to buy a plot of land, you know, a cave, you know, to bury his wife. <laughs> Abraham then took another wife at 137. Her name was Keturah, and he had six more sons in his remaining 38 years of life. So when God gave Abraham and Sarah the, the vitality to have a child naturally, 
he didn't just, how can I say this? He, did, he didn't just say, okay, tomorrow night, <laughs> you, you're both going to be feeling pretty good. And he gave Abraham vitality and he kept that vitality for decades afterwards to the point where he had even more children. All right, a couple of lessons. If you enter a faith relationship with God, here's what to expect. Abraham is a type that shows what faith can do and not what faith, faith must do, okay? Remember that. If you enter a faith relationship with God, here's what to expect. One, expect testing, expect it. Abraham entered a faith relationship with God and was immediately considered righteous and thus saved. His faith, however, was continually tested. It was tested because it's through testing that faith grows. It is through maturing faith that we see God more clearly. And it is through a clear vision of God that we can experience hope and joy and peace. That's the relationship. Your faith is tested so it can grow. Your faith grows so your eyes open. Your eyes open so you can see more clearly who God is. When you see more clearly who God is, you gain strength and joy, which does what? Which strengthens your faith. And a stronger faith opens your eyes even wider. And your eyes being open even wider makes you able to do things even greater and you know, so on and so on. So God tests our faith not to destroy it, not to destroy us, not to prove us as hypocrites or unworthy. You know, by testing I mean allowing us to experience trials and sufferings and so on and so forth, even doubt. He tests faith in order to make it grow and through growing faith enable us to arrive at peace and joy. If you enter a faith relationship with God, expect testing. Don't be angry, don't be afraid, don't be discouraged. Realize that God is just working on you. Lise used to say that. She'd be going through a period of testing, you know, and, and she'd say, oh, God's got the yellow ribbon around me, you know, like the guys in the, you know, the works, the guys from the city, you know, they put up the yellow tape, you know, because they're digging in the ground, there's work going on. She'd say, you know, God's got the yellow tape around me. He's working on me. He works on all of us, if we let him. Number two, if you have a relationship with God, expect quality. Don't consider it good luck or a fluke that you are growing in your ability to serve the Lord or your ability to resist sin, your ability to be, to be able to love others more. The whole purpose of salvation is to change us from sinners to saints. So let's rejoice when we see ourselves drawn upwards in what we are thinking and what we're doing. It's supposed to happen because of your faith. If it isn't happening, maybe your faith is dead and if so, it can't save you. So expect quality works from living by faith. And then last thing, expect God to provide. Abraham's faith was summed up in his answer to Isaac when he asked where the sacrifice was coming from. And Abraham said, the Lord will provide. That's what Moriah means in Hebrew. That's why they named the place that, the place where God will provide. So at one time or another, every Christian goes to their own Mount Moriah in the form of testing. Everybody's been to Mount Moriah. Everybody, I'm looking around and I've known a lot of you for a long time, and I know that all of you have been to Mount Moriah, you know, whether it's through family issues or money issues or emotion or illness or sin or relationships or you know, bad things happening to you or whatever. Everybody here, including me, we've all been to Mount Moriah at one time or another in our lives. The thing that we have to remember is that God will provide at your Mount Moriah whenever and wherever that takes place. God provides for the flowers and the animals, even unbelievers have what they need. So for his own children, you know, God will surely provide. If he provides for sinners, you know, why wouldn't he provide for me? Sometimes the greatest test of our faith is to trust that when the time comes, God will provide what we need. And like Abraham and Sarah, many times we, we kind of run ahead of him or try to solve it ourselves or we quit. You know, we leave them out. You know. All right, so that's it for this time. Thank you for your attention.